Hi, this is Professor of Photography Jeff Curto, and welcome to episode number nine of the History of Photography podcast. Today we're going to spend some time with the concepts of image latency and also image immediacy. Sort of go through those things and talk about them as a historical concept. You know, when photography first appeared in the late 1830s and the early 1840s, both viewers and practitioners of this new medium expected that a photograph was a surrogate for human vision, a replacement for the idea of human vision. In the earliest days of photography, there was an assumption that the image would be immediately visible after the eye of the camera opened and closed. This was based on the generally held belief that the lens-based camera would capture exactly what the eye saw, and since the eye saw instantaneously, so should the camera. This is one of those places where we have to try really hard, I think, to take ourselves back to the pre-photography era. If we think about this from the point of view of people who have never seen, or of course made a photograph before, it makes perfect sense. The eye opened and saw the world, so why shouldn't the camera? The fact that photography didn't react in an instant was confounding to many early users and viewers of photographs. What people hadn't factored in was the latent image. When light-sensitive material is exposed to light, a chemical change happens, but this change isn't necessarily visible. This idea is perhaps part of why early photographers and early viewers of photographic images had a hard time with the concept of the latent image. Yet, it was one of the most important components of the technology of photography in its infancy. For long-time listeners of the podcast, and of course for photographers accustomed to the traditional photographic darkroom, this concept is pretty much a given. When light-sensitive material is exposed to light, a chemical change occurs in the material, but no visible change. But some further action is required to make that visible image happen. For the daguerreotype, a piece of copper was plated with silver, and then the plate was sensitized with iodine before it was put into the camera. Silver iodide compound, a silver salt, therefore it was light sensitive. After the exposure, you couldn't see anything on the plate, and it wasn't until the plate was put over a tray of heated mercury that the action of the light on the silver iodide plate was made visible, resulting in an image of the scene in front of the camera. In fact, image latency was kind of a surprise to Daguerre as well. Daguerre, the inventor, well, one of the inventors, along with Niepce, of the daguerreotype process. He had placed some previously exposed plates in a closet and closed the door. He came back later to discover an image had appeared on the plates, and it was only after a period of trial and error that he figured out that it was an open tray of mercury that was in that same closet that had caused the images to appear. When Daguerre announced his process to the public, it was difficult to convince people that an image was being made purely by the action of light. Since photography was assumed to be recreating human vision, there was an assumption that the camera was supposed to create that image instantaneously. Of course, Daguerre's job of convincing the public that his camera was actually making images that couldn't be seen until some action was performed upon them wasn't helped at all when he would take the plate out of the camera and disappear into a dark room so that he could do that fuming of the plate over mercury to make the latent image appear. And then he'd emerge a few minutes later with a completed image. I'm sure many people must have thought that he had a pre-made image in his little dark room instead of having just made the photograph. It was a little bit different across the channel in England, where William Henry Fox Talbot had invented his negative-positive process, the calotype. Since Fox Talbot's process used a piece of paper, that was made light sensitive by a combination of salt and silver, when the images came out of the back of the camera, the image was visible. But the problem was that in order to create an image that was correctly exposed, a very, very long exposure time was needed. And eventually Talbot hit on the idea of a short exposure that could be amplified with further exposure to a chemical developer. 
after the camera's shutter had opened and closed, enhancing the latent image on the paper. In this way, short exposure times could be used and development would make the latent image visible. From Talbot's calotype through the wet plate collodion process of the later 19th century and still later dry glass plate processes, image latency became more accepted and more understood. As photographers went out into the field and made their negatives, and in fact processed those negatives in darkroom tents that they set up specifically for that purpose, people understood that there was a sort of lag time between the time that the image was made and the time that the image could be seen. By the time flexible film photography arrived in the late 19th century, both photographers and the public were aware that while light affected the light-sensitive materials, the image was invisible until it was developed. Printing images from negatives evolved in the same way. For most processes, the image was latent and invisible until chemical development occurred. George Eastman took advantage of that with his Kodak camera, which he released in 1888, uh, when you were done with the 100 exposures in the camera, you sent the whole thing, the camera itself, back to Eastman's lab, where the film would be developed and the images from that film would be printed onto negatives. Uh, Eastman's motto, you press the button, we do the rest, really was correct because his lab would do all of the work and thereby create that lag time between when the photographs were made and when the user who made the photographs could see the images. Thinking in terms of a latent image that needed development changed how photographs were taken and printed. As chemical processes improved, exposure times could be shortened, which made photographs of subjects that were transitory an awful lot easier to make. Eventually, the making of the photograph in the camera became a separate operation from the processing or developing of that photograph into a visible image. After the exposure was made, development could be postponed for days or weeks, or even months. Here on this slide, uh, Leopold Godowski and Leopold Manns, two professional musicians and amateur chemists, and these are guys who cracked the code for Eastman. Uh, they, in fact, were the uh, two people responsible uh, for figuring out in Eastman's labs uh, how to make color photography possible on a commercial scale. And uh, that color material uh, required a lab, the color material Kodachrome, released in 1936. And the lab, of course, created a lapse of time uh, in order to process that film with this, the very careful controls that were required for developing this color material. Even the invention of the Polaroid process by Edwin Land was based on the latent image. In 1943, in Santa Fe, Land was asked by his three-year-old daughter why the camera that they used couldn't produce a photograph immediately. Land mulled the question over and was inspired to invent the Polaroid Land camera, named after himself, just like Daguerre did with the Daguerreotype, and uh, Fox Talbot initially called his process the Talbot type, uh, so the Polaroid Land camera. Even though Land's process was instantaneous, it was still based on a latent image and development of that image with chemicals, and the image still wasn't available to be viewed immediately after exposure. The process took at least a minute or two. With the invention of digital photography in the late 20th century, image latency has been pushed aside, and we now have the ability to see our images immediately after exposure. The digital sensors in today's cameras, whether it's a phone camera or a more sophisticated DSLR, form an image by creating an electrical charge on a reaction to light. Here's Steve Sasson, the inventor of the first digital camera, and here he is with, with his camera. It's a, a pretty remarkably uh, uh, fabulous looking device, right? I mean, here this thing is, it's just incredible, uh, with uh, the cassette tape on the side to record the image. 1975, pretty terrific. Still, software inside the camera is needed to transform that binary ones and zeros data of the digital camera sensor into an image that we can see. 
but we can now see the image instantaneously without any delay for processing the latent image. And here is Bruce Bayer, uh, to whom we owe a great uh, debt of gratitude, who in 1976 figured out the Bayer filter, which is red, green, and blue sensors that allow the digital camera to record all the colors of the spectrum using this grid of red, green, blue. And then he figured out the software that was needed to uh, interpolate the image from that grid of RGB sensors. So there we are, image latency, uh, image immediacy, the medium that was supposed to be instantaneous turned out to not be, at least at first, but now it is. Another example of how the medium has continued to evolve and speed up over time. So thank you for joining me on this episode. During the summer months, the History Podcast will be on uh, a little bit uh, a broader schedule. Uh, we'll try for about once a month. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Uh, for those of you who are interested in hearing some more podcasts about photography, you may want to check out my other podcast, Camera Position, at cameraposition.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Don't forget to check out the History of Photography class sessions available on the web at photohistory.jeffcurto.com or in the podcast feed. And while you're on the web, take a look at my other podcast, cameraposition.com, a podcast about the creative side of photography. <laughs>